Hello, good morning. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for journeying through the winter wonderland and making your way here today. Um, we are so grateful to have you. Um, this is my first community gathering, but I know a lot of people who really look forward to this day each semester. Um, it's a chance to come together and honor and celebrate all of the amazing work of our students, our faculty, our community partners, all the staff that are working behind the scenes to make things happen. And it's a chance for all of us to get a little taste of uh, what our students have been up to this semester. And yeah, so that's what we're doing here. Very excited to be here. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah. Um, hey everyone, I'm Mohammed, Director of Programs with HECUA. Yes. Um, this is my third community gathering. But this is my first time on this side of the community gathering. So I'm very, very excited to be here. I'm excited to see all of you. I've had the, the great fortune and privilege, as well as Rachel, to observe the students over the course of the semester and to, to kind of get a taste of the work that they're doing. Um, so this is a real treat for us. It's, a, I think, a real treat for all of you to be able to celebrate and honor and to offer some gratitude and to you know, offer some warm wishes at the end of a semester where we're kind of closing out one journey and beginning a new journey that this is, uh, this is an incredible time for, for HECUA. Um, what students are doing here today, this presentation is, is a lot like a number of the presentations that students are doing in all kinds of different HECUA programs. So you're gonna see this slideshow back here. Well, what was, what was going on while we were mingling and, and, uh, and getting settled are kind of a snapshots in, that, that are from a lot of the other HECUA programs. So um, there are HECUA programs in six countries, including this one, and the work that students are doing here in the United States is, is being replicated in different ways across, across our, our HECUA community. And so this is, you, you know, our students are a part of, uh, a part of this community, a part of, of the work that's happening here in the Twin Cities, but are also a part of a larger movement for more and more critical experiential and place-based education. So this is, a, this is an incredible opportunity for us to celebrate the work that they're doing, but also to, to, to be reminded that our work here is connected to the work that we're doing um, more broadly across, across our globe. So I wanna offer a, a special thanks, a special welcome to all of you uh, for being here today. In addition to uh, a special kind of uh, word of thanks to our hosts, the St. Paul Neighborhood Network. I wanna yeah. give them a can quick we, shout out, a round of applause. applause. They did a lot behind the scenes to make this come together. So Absolutely. we're very grateful. And SPNN is not just hosting us today, but they actually host the Making Media, Making Change program. So the MMMC mm. students are here every week, multiple times a week, doing, doing great work. So um, cool. Um, just to quickly see who's in the room, could I have first the students raise their hand? Awesome. <laughs> Give it up for our students. Um, how about? Anyone who is a part of the faculty? Yes. <laughs> How about anyone who is a family, friend, partner connected to a student? Awesome. Thank you for being here. And then how about community partners? Any of the, the, the huge community that's a part of our learning? Supervisors of students in their internships? Cool, similar category. And staff. HECUA staff. staff. Awesome, the dream team. Wonderful, so thank you for um, showing up. This is an awesome reflection of the huge community of people that are a part of what HECUA does and is about. Um, yeah. Anything else right now? We want to introduce the yeah. students. Yes. Okay. okay. So um, I'm going to introduce to you now our first of three programs who will be presenting today. This is Inequality in America Fall 2019. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. 
My name is Christina Curtis, and I'm from the Inequality in America program, along with the 12 other students who I know are really excited to share with you what we've been learning about for the past semester. We've had the opportunity to draw experiences from our reading seminars, our internships, and we've had a variety across the board, and our field seminars, which meant that we were being directly in the communities and learned directly from the people who are being affected by inequality in America. And I think I can speak for the entire class when I say that there were several moments in the semester, if not the semester as a whole, that have deeply impacted us and will continue to motivate us to not only transform our communities, but transform the world. One, oh, some of the things we have learned have actually changed or shaped the way how we look at how homelessness, housing, education, healthcare, economic inequality, social and racial inequities all coexist and stay in our communities. And uh, one of the exercises that was really significant to our learning experience and that we also wanted you to experience was a chair exercise. Now some of you may have already done this exercise or even participated in it, but what we'll be doing is demonstrating the wealth distribution in this nation and how it has transformed over the past 60 years. And Sean and Alexa will be helping to co-facilitate this exercise, but we're also going to need more help. So we're going to need some volunteers from the audience. So we should see hands going up right now. Come up, yes. Any more? Thank you. So as you can see on the stage, we have 10 chairs and we have 10 people. So what each chair represents is 10% of the wealth in the nation, and each person represents 10% of the population. So right now, it's all evenly distributed. Each 10% of the population has 10% of the wealth. But we are going to move into the 1960s. So what this means is I'm going to ask Angie and Anne to leave their seats and stand behind one of these other chairs. Anyone? So what's happening in the 1960s is that the top 10% of the population now has 30% of all the wealth in the nation, while the rest of the 90% of the population has only 70% of all the wealth in the nation. And uh, just to give a little context of what's kind of happening is that the CEO, the average CEO to worker ratio is 40 to one, and 32% uh, of the workforce is unionized. Um, so fast forward 10 years, it is now the 1970s, and the top 10% owns 50% of the wealth, and the bottom 90% also owns 50% of the wealth. So I'm going to ask you two to please stand up and stand behind the rest of these chairs, as along with Ann and Angie. <laughs> so during this time, the average CEO to worker pay is 80 to 1 and the number of workers unionized dropped to 23%. Okay, I'm just gonna take a pause in this little lesson um, and um, encourage you guys to begin thinking about uh, what does this actually look like for individuals on the ground? Um, what does it look like for society when 50% uh, of the wealth in the nation is owned by 10% of the population, while 50% of the existing wealth is shared or, quite frankly, fought over by 90% um, of the population. What does that look like for you and me? What does that look like for our society? And while you guys begin doing that, I'm going to jump 20 years to the 1990s, um, where 70% of the wealth is controlled by the top 10%, while 30% is shared by the rest of the people, the 90%. So I'm going to ask both you two to stand up and everybody kind of bunch up between these three chairs. When Phil did this exercise with us in September, he wanted us to sit on each other um, to kind of <laughs> exemplify um, us kind of bunching together. Um, and we refuse to do that, so I'm not going to make you guys do that. Um, but hopefully the, the point still stands. Um, in the 1990s, 15% uh, of the workforce was unionized and the average CEO to worker pay was 150 to 1. So fast forward 10 years, 
It is now the 2000s. The top 10% now owns 90% of the wealth, and the bottom 90% now, own only, now owns only 10% of the wealth. Uh, the CEO to worker pay reached 525 to 1, and the workforce unionized was only 13%. So if I could have Mohammed and Nora stand up and everyone else kind of bunch behind this one chair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can try to touch the chair. Just got to bunch up behind the chair, please. Yeah. <laughs> How are we feeling over here? Great. Yep. <laughs> How are you feeling over there? Great. Yeah, as I suspected. <laughs> well, I assure you guys, it only gets worse. Um, 2018, um, the top 10% now controls 92% of the wealth, while the remaining 90% controls just 8% of the wealth. So I'm going to ask that you stand, Siri. Can we remove this chair? You sit on this, and could everybody attempt to touch the chair? Yeah, get in nice and tight. Yep. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, to give some context, in 2018, the average CEO to worker pay was 361 to 1, um, while 11% of the workforce was unionized. Um, so I encourage us to just kind of like take this in. Um, notice the distance between the top 10% and the remaining 90%, um, and really think about how this makes you feel. Um, I think when we were playing the community gathering just two weeks ago, uh, a lot of us came together and we were like, we have to do this exercise. We did this exercise way back in September, and we all remember how much this affected us then. Um, and really, this touched everything that we learned this semester. Um, one of the things that Phil, our teacher, really drilled into our heads was this idea that the more inequality, um, the worse these things get. Um, and, oof, sorry. <laughs> it's just hard for me to take this in, too. Um, the reality is the more inequality that any society experiences, um, the more violence that our communities experience, um, the more inequality that we experience in our society, um, that looks like you and me being more likely to skip a doctor's appointment um, if we're sick or injured because we can't afford it. It looks like um, half a million Americans being homeless while 1.5 million houses are vacant throughout the United States. It looks like billions and billions of pounds of food being wasted um, in our schools and cafeteria just thrown out while 45 million Americans are experiencing hunger or um, food insecurity. Um, so I just encourage you guys to take this in um, and yeah. And something that I think we need to take note of that I don't think we're inclined to realize is that the people sharing the 8% of the wealth are not people who are just experiencing homelessness or living in poverty. The people who are sharing the 8% of the wealth are, yes, the people who are experiencing homelessness, but also the working class, the middle class, the upper middle class. They're all sharing that 8% of the wealth, all the wealth in the nation. And so when we can see this gap right here between the top 10% and the 90% of the population, remember that there's also a gap between the people who are sharing the 8%, because we know, I think we can all imagine that somebody who is experiencing homelessness does not have the same as someone who's in the upper middle class. And probably the last point we'd like to leave you with this exercise is that this doesn't just happen naturally. Um, this is very structural and very systemic and very intentional in a way too, I think. This is an example of a system designed to do something like this. Um, and hopefully our next exercise, the latter exercise, which Siri will introduce, will help um, articulate that aspect of it too. So you guys can sit down. Thank you to our volunteers. So my name is Siri, and as we can see, there's a lot of debate surrounding the wealth inequality that we saw demonstrated in, oh, 
in the chair exercise that um, continues to persist and worsen in this country. Um, wealth and income inequality are connected. Um, wealth meaning assets, so things that you own. Income meaning wages, so like what you're being paid. Um, in the next exercise that we're going to do, it has to do with more of um, income inequality and the different things that people attribute to why that occurs in this nation. Um, specifically, structure versus agency. So structure meaning um, different societal institutions, et cetera, that contribute to those things versus like people's behaviors or personal choices. Um, and yeah. Okay. Norris, do you want to come with me? Okay, so now we're moving into the ladder exercise. This demonstration is going to show you guys how um, the structure versus agency argument actually kind of plays out in real lives. So I'm going to introduce you to two different people, um, and <laughs> I will show you how the paths that they were born into affect the choices that they get to make. Um, their relative place on the ladder will represent their relative success in society. Okay, so over here, let me introduce you to Taylor. Taylor was born a cis, able-bodied white man. He um, will experience less racial, gender, and ability-based oppression because of this. So he will start at a higher position. So Taylor grew up in Arden Hills, Minnesota. The median household income in Arden Hills is just below 80,000. In Arden Hills, 18.4% um, of the population is experiencing um, cost burden. <laughs> so cost burden is where a family is spending more than a third of their income on housing. So that's either rent or a mortgage. So 18.4% in Arden Hills in Taylor's neighborhood. Um, he is fortunate enough to not fall into this category. Um, he grew up in this beautiful three-bedroom home um, with his mom and dad and little brother. This stability in his life played a huge factor in his success. He always had a warm place to go, always had electricity, always had a clean house, and a quiet place to go do homework, get away from people. So he takes another step up. Okay. Sid, over here. <laughs> Hi, Sid. Sid um, was born a cis, able-bodied woman of color. Because of this, she will experience more racial and gender-based oppression in her life. Sid grew up in the Frogtown neighborhood in St. Paul. In St. Paul, the median income is just below 38000 That is over two and a half times less than what Taylor experienced in Arden Hills. Um, keep in mind, they're about 15, 20 minutes apart from each other. Also, like I said, in Arden Hills, Taylor experienced, no, Taylor's neighborhood had 18.4% cost burdened. Um, Sid's neighborhood in Frogtown, 42% of the people living there are experiencing um, a cost burden. Unfortunately, Sid's family does fall into this, so her family is struggling. Um, they're paying more than a third of their income to rent. Uh, this is at the point where people start spending more, less money on food, skipping doctor's appointments, stuff like that. Um, so Sid grew up in multiple different two-bedroom apartments, also with her mom, dad, and little brother. Um, they were forced to move because of rent increases and job changes. Nonetheless, she did always have a place to go home to after school. Okay. So, uh, Taylor over here spent his childhood attending Valentine Hills Elementary, where 45% of the students are from low-income families, and 44% of those students are, in t total, are students of color. Less than 1% of students uh, attending Valentine Hills are ever s experiencing suspension. Uh, his school ranks above average for test scores and has a very high rate of student progress, which allows Taylor to perform very well throughout school and continue to do well in high school. You can take a step up. <laughs> Overall, Taylor received a very high quality childhood education. Sid, on the other hand, attended Mar Maxfield Magnet Elementary where 93% of students come from low-income households and 95% of the students are people of color. 
her school ranks the lowest possible for test scores and extremely low on student progress. 21% of students who attend her are suspended at some point throughout their schooling compared to less than 1%. Even so, she was able to complete her childhood education and go on to graduate high school. So you can take a step. And Taylor's father is a professor in the business department at a local private college. He's able to attend the private college using the 95% reduced tuition rate for dependents of university employees. Having grown up in the area and having built-in rapport with faculty and staff from his father, Taylor is able to enjoy the typical college experience. Take a step up. Since he is able to attend a local private college at such a reduced rate, Taylor is also able to pay for graduate school at the Carlson School for Management, which is part of the University of Minnesota. After graduating, Sid looked into attending colleges throughout the, the state, but realized that it wasn't a reasonable possibility for her. Her job and family obligations throughout high school kept her from attending and or participating in extracurriculars, building leadership opportunities, and networking with her teachers, which kept her from getting many of the available scholarship and financial assistance programs. The college workload would also be incredibly challenging um, while she's working full time. So with his graduate degree in business, Taylor went into consulting work immediately after business school. The average starting salary for students who graduated from Carlson Business School and went into consulting in 2019 was just under $123,000 a year. So it's safe to say that Taylor's career life was going pretty well. Now on the other hand, career life was very different for Sid. Since college was not economically feasible for her, she began to work full time at the cashier job that she had held throughout high school. She was earning $10 an hour, or just about $20,000 a year. So it was enough to survive, but not really enough to get ahead. However, this meant that Sid did qualify for some welfare programs. She barely qualified for food stamps. She qualifies for Section 8 housing, but has been on the waiting list for over a year. She does not qualify for Medicaid, but she does qualify for Minnesota Care, which means that she can get affordable insurance for a small monthly premium. And since she does not have kids or live in a large household, she does not qualify for any forms of cash assistance. So this welfare made life slightly easier for Sid, allowing her to step up a little bit more. However, after working five years at her cashier job, Sid got promoted to a management position and earned a raise of $1.50 an hour, now making $24,000 a year. Since she got a raise, she lost all of her welfare benefits. She lost her extremely low income classification as well, which meant that Section 8 housing would be much more difficult to get. So in the long run, her raise actually ended up hurting her, making her take another step down. When it comes to health care, Taylor is insured under his parents' health care plan until he was 26 years old, allowing his family to pay for any medical care that he would need. You can put one foot up. By the time he reached 26, his high, his high income from his full-time job offered him affordable health care as a part of his plan for working for the company. On the other hand, Sid, throughout her life, struggled to afford health care from her family. Sid was born with asthma, and her family often struggled to afford inhalers or any other doctor visits. This meant she was unable to participate in activities such as sports, since her asthma could not be treated. As a working adult, Sid made too much money to qualify for Medicaid, but was able to purchase Minnesota Care with a small monthly premium. But after she got a raise of $1.50 an hour, she was unable to afford Minnesota Care and could not afford any health insurance plans leaving her uninsured and allowing her asthma to grow worse once again. Um, throughout the rest of his life, Taylor was proud of all the things he accomplished as a result of all of his hard work. He had grown up in an average middle class home and managed to work hard in school and become very successful in the field of consulting. He knew that he deserved everything he earned and took few shortcuts to get where he is. 
The only thing wrong with his finance was that he wished he didn't have to pay too many taxes. On the other hand, though, we have Sid. Um, Sid continued to work full time at her managing position, uh, but seemed to always be falling behind on paying for her expenses. At some point, she knows she will have to take a second job or find a better paying job. But there are few options available for high school graduates. She's considering finding a lower paying job since she doesn't receive any welfare benefits and she continues to live paycheck to paycheck. So just to bring this all together, I want to remind you about the two demonstrations that we did here today. One, we did the chair exercise that showed the distribution of wealth in the US. Um, it showed us where the money and the resources lie, or rather who they lie with. Um, and secondly, we just did the ladder exercise, which shows you how these inequalities actually play out in America and affect real people's lives in areas of education, housing, wages. Yeah, I really think it's um, easy. Hot mic, sorry. I think it's really easy to think that the position that we are in um, in society is a result of the choices that we make, but that really ignores um, how a lot of the systems um, built in place actually perpetuate inequality as opposed to fixing them or addressing them. Um, I think one of the hardest lessons that we're all kind of taking from this course is that um, the way our capitalist society runs really necessitates deep inequality, actually. Um, even our uh, definition of full employment accommodates for 4% of all workers being unemployed. Also, we didn't even scratch the surface of how race and class dynamics play into these inequalities. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of how deep this goes, I'm going to tell you about a study that was done in 2017 by the Boston Globe Spotlight series. So their goal was to figure out the difference between the median net worth of white families in Boston and compare that to the median net worth of African American families in Boston. So they found that the median net worth of a white family in Boston was $247,000. Okay, so when we were learning about this in class, we were asked to estimate what we thought the um, African American family median net worth would be based on this $247,000 number. We were thinking like, okay, by this point in the semester, we know it's gonna be pretty bad. It's probably like 100,000, 80,000, maybe even 60,000. Let me tell you, we were wrong. We were very, very wrong. The median net worth for an African American family in Boston in 2017 was $8. And um, gender is just as relevant. Um, women made up the majority of um, doctorate earners for the eighth consecutive year, I think last year, um, or was it this year? I think it was this year, 2018. Um, and, but they only make up about 32% of all full-time college professors and 30% of college presidents. Um, Congress is 80% men, Congress is 80% white. Um, and I think frequently about how um, the ideas that um, could change the world and the innovations that could change the world, they exist in the voices of those who have been silenced um, and to the people that will never have the power or even the chance to change them. So basically what we're telling you here today is that if we want to change anything in this country, we're going to have to do two things. One, we're going to have to be willing to let the veil drop and actually understand what's going on in our communities, our country, and the world around us. Two, we're gonna have to start having conversations where everyone is invited to the table. So a lot of what we learned this semester was actually really uncomfortable to come to terms with. And I just want to acknowledge that if anything that we said today made you uncomfortable or anxious or even like irritated, um, that's normal, it's part of the process. We felt that too, but honestly, that's exactly what we need. That's what it's gonna take to make our communities a safe and dignified places for everyone to live. We have to be willing to be uncomfortable. Um, so thank you for listening to our presentation. We're just gonna do a quick introduction so everybody 
come around um, so you can meet everybody. <laughs> well, um, my name is Sean. Um, I'm a senior at Bethel University, and I st uh, interned this semester at the Minneapolis Regional Labor Federation. Hi, um, my name is Siri, and I'm a senior at the University of Minnesota, Rochester, um, and I interned with Sean at the Minneapolis Regional Labor Federation. Um, we were going to give a shout out to Casey, but he's not, he's not here, so. Um, so my name's Andra. I'm a student at Colorado College. I'm Ellie Nelson. I'm a student at Bethel University. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Um, we both interned at Homeline. <laughs> we both interned at Homeline this semester, which is a nonprofit tenant organization. Um, shout out to Michael Dahl, who was our supervisor. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. We just wanted to thank you for being patient with us and teaching us everything you, that you did and helped us grow in ways that I actually didn't anticipate. Thank you, Michael. Um, hi, uh, my name is Alexa Carter, and uh, I am a junior at the College of St. Scholastica in Duluth. Okay, side note, I knew she looked familiar, okay? <laughs> um, so I work, uh, I internshiped at Take Action Minnesota this in. Yeah, they're pretty great. And I want to give a shout out to my supervisor, Lily. She's right there. <laughs> Um, and I want to thank you and the Take Action team for allowing me to come into your space and learn how uh, your organization, organization works and how you are all working to make a better Minnesota. So thank you. My name is Angie Smith. Um, I go to Bethel University. <laughs> <laughs> and I interned at Avalon. With me, I'm yeah. Ann Vandehei, and I'm a senior at the University of Minnesota, studying sociology. Shout out to Kevin. Yes. He showed up. He's in the orange beanie. He's not going to raise his hand. Right there. there you go. <laughs> Woo! Just wants to be silent over yeah. there. We really appreciate all the work you did with us, and we learned so much, not only from you, but also all the students at Avalon. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm not Taylor. Uh, <laughs> or white, but uh, I'm Norris, and I go to the University of Minnesota and I, uh, here in Minneapolis. And this past semester, I interned at Outfront Minnesota. Uh, I wanna give a shout out to my supervisor, Junior, back there. Thank you for everything. <laughs> uh, it's been a great pleasure working this semester and also working on the ban on conversion therapy in Minneapolis, so. Hi everyone, my name is Christina Curtis and I'm a senior at Bethel University. I interned at Equity Alliance Minnesota, which is an organization working towards educational equity. And my, my supervisor and I here, but shout out to her if she's watching. And shout out to Dr. May, who's here, who's our advisor. Thank you so much for everything you've done. <laughs> My name is Hannah Rowe. I'm a student at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. I'm interning at the Health Commons this semester. It's a new one for HECUA. Um, so I, I work at the Health Commons in downtown Minneapolis and also the one at the Cedar Riverside community. So shout out for Katie and Rebecca who are not here today because they're still doing the work for the, um, that site today. Um, yeah. um, hello. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mohammed. I go to the University of Minnesota, majoring in Global Studies, and we are also interning in Eastside Freedom Library. <laughs> hey, I'm Sid, I'm also a student at the University of Minnesota. Uh, shout out to Clarence, our supervisor, and also shout out to Mohammed, who just gained his U.S. citizenship. We really wanted to do this for him because he was obviously really excited about this, and I think we all know that it's not always an easy process, so we just wanted to show um, some love for Mohammed. And 
We also want to show appreciation to Ms. Julia Dinsmore, who I know is watching right now. <laughs> Yeah, I know she could be here. She definitely would be here. Um, so we love you, Julia. Thank you. And we want to shout out to Phil. It's first, Phil. <laughs> Phil, we this semester. Let me tell you <laughs> that. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. And uh, we also want to shout out to all the people in the community who came through and helped us to learn and share their knowledge and allowed us to be a part of their communities and find ways for us to do more work and transform our communities. So we want to thank you all. That's it. And that's all we have for today. Thank you. Give it up one more time for Inequality in America. Beautiful. All right, so next up we have Making Media, Making Change. And while they make their way to the front, we have a quick announcement from Audra. All right, so hi everybody. My name is Audra, and I'm a campus representative for HECUA, and I'm also an alum of the Inequality in America program, and I did that, thank you. Um, I did that program last semester and graduated from the University of Minnesota. Um, so today I'm just here to talk to you all about a few cool ways that you can still stay involved with HECUA. So the first is for any students that are here today, including all of you, we have an alumni ambassador program through HECUA. And what that basically is, is you help us with recruiting on your campus. So how it works is you do three different recruiting events and you can pick whatever kind of events you wanna do. So it could be like tabling or having info sessions or going into classrooms and talking to students about HECUA. And if you do three of those, then you get $100. So I think that you all should do it. And anyone who works with, or anyone who goes to the University of Minnesota, your main contact person for that is Liza, who's in the back right there. Um, and then if you go to any school that's in the state of Minnesota that's not the University of Minnesota system, then I am your contact person for that. So Bethel, I heard a few Bethel students. I, I am the person to contact for that. <laughs> Um, so do the Alumni Ambassador Program, students. And then for everyone else, if you're just looking to get involved with HECUA too, we also have volunteer opportunities. We had a sign-up sheet. Um, another good person to go to is Anna, who's right here, our Marketing and Communications Manager. Um, we're gonna have a lot of events coming up in the upcoming year or so, so we would love to have volunteers and also help with mailings too, because we also like getting money at HECUA to help support our programs and our students. Um, and then finally, if you know anybody who's interested in a HECUA program, or students, if you want to do another program, or if you have a friend that wants to do a program, um, myself and Liza are also good contacts. If you want us to connect, you, like get connected with somebody that you already know, um, we would love to talk to you about our other programs that we have abroad, and then also other domestic programs too. But yeah, that's all I have, so thank you. And we're gonna move on to making media making change. All right, so uh, my name's Grace. I'm gonna start out just kind of talking about the internships. Um, not all of us did internships, but I think a good amount of us did, and most of us, all of us, did them here at SPNN. So yeah, we're gonna start off with internships, and I think we're gonna talk about um, some stuff that we learned in class, and then end on three videos that we made, right? Um, so I interned with, or in the community production department. So, um, a lot of what we did was covering local elections. It was an election year, so we um, we went to like debates and worked um, cameras and worked on the coverage for that, which was really fun. And then also, um, SPNN has some programming that they do here: um, disability viewpoints, Candy Fresh, uh, SPNN forms. So we just kind of got to work on all of the shoots for that and learn a lot about technical stuff, about um, 
media production and kind of take what we learned in the classroom and apply it to our internship here. Um, I think someone else is going to talk about internships too. Yeah, um, I could talk a bit about the Access Center. So um, we have uh, members here at SPNN, and they can uh, come in and check out equipment and use it to make whatever kind of media um, that they would like to make. Um, and so I guess my experience in the Access Center has been um, getting to see what community members are making, a lot of people making uh, various documentaries. Um, I once had a guy come in and say he was filming on the train, like just talking to people on the train. I don't know what was up with that, but it's very interesting. So <laughs> you can make whatever type of media that you want. Um, and also part of my internship, and I think um, a lot of us too, was making tech tips and uh, member profiles. Uh, so part of tech tips is it's also another part of um, helping the community to make the media that they want to make. Um, and that's more than just checking out equipment and giving them the cameras and the audio equipment to do what they want. It's also providing educational material, like little uh, video clips and um, tutorials on how to maybe edit and how to use cameras. Um, and as far as our member profiles, that's sort of a I guess a benefit we do for the members and we um, sort of profile what uh, they're doing. Like for instance, my member profile is on Bi Cities, which is um, an LGBT show that has been going on for decades. Um, and so Marge and Anita come in um, every once in a while and they do shows to educate the community about um, various queer issues, so yeah. I was uh, the youth programs intern at SPNN. Youth, um, SPNN has three youth programs right now. It's Media Active, which is a group of youth producers that partners with a nonprofit client and then makes media for them. We have Createch, which is basically like an open space for uh, young people that want to come in and learn about creating media in some form. And then we have YAC, the Youth Action Committee, which basically picks an issue that they are passionate about and works on events that uh, that's focus on that issue, give it a spotlight for about a year, and they also work with events and stuff like that. Like, they're right now planning a queer prom in the spring. Um, it's in a bit of a, of a rebuilding process right now. SPNN's undergone a, lot of, undergone a lot of changes. So a lot of the time was spent uh, on outreach, new, recruiting new participants, new client members um, to partner with. And I think the best part, though, for me, was just getting to work with a couple of, like, the right track workers from St. Paul. Um, yeah, and yeah, a lot of the right track workers, so like high school age students, um, just meeting with them after school and having snacks and being like, how was your day? How was it? Yeah. Um, my name is Frances, so I'm going to talk a little bit about class. Um, so we spent six hours a week in class in addition to the internships, um, and that was really important for kind of like building a foundation for the rest of the work we do we're doing, because none of the filmmaking we were doing occurred in a vacuum. Um, so we talked a lot about larger context of other social movements and kind of how they used media to make change. Um, and then we talked, at, like a lot of questions came up in class of like the ethics of who we're interviewing, um, like who controls the narrative, like are we allowed to tell certain stories, um, which all for me personally came up to be very useful because I think every project we worked on, there was some kind of like moral dilemma about like using certain interview subjects, words the wrong way. Um, so it was just really important to have that foundation um, earlier in class, which we took into our projects and the internships. Yeah, um, my name is Terrell. Uh, we talked a lot about that, and then along with that, we did a lot of the production side of things. Um, a lot of like figuring things out, not a lot of us had used the editing software, checked out cameras, or I hadn't even used a camera before, so like, or like that kind of way. And um, we spent Wednesdays building our skills on editing and production and lighting and all those kind of things. So on Monday, we would talk about like issues and expanding on those things. And Wednesday, we would talk about like the tech side of things. Um, so now we're, we have three videos. We made a story of self, 
a story of now and a story of us. So the story of self was an opportunity to be vulnerable and tell a story about yourself because we thought that if you're gonna ask people to interview them and get deep within their story, you should be able to tell your own story and be open with them. And so we all made, it was the first video we made, and so we didn't know that much about the cameras, so the idea was just make a story and tell a story. It doesn't have to look great, but just like have someone feel something, and so you're gonna watch mine. Um, my name's Jane, by the way. You're gonna watch mine, and I encourage you. We all took it so many different directions, and I think on the SPNN website, it's all of our story of selves. So if you wanna watch them, we all took it very different ways, but um, here's mine, and then we'll watch two other videos that we made. forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. At the tone, please record your message. Um, hey, so it's me again. It's been like an hour. Um, I'm just going to assume you're not coming. You're not responding still, and I'm getting a little worried. Please, just call me or text me. Hey, so, um, I went home. I'm not mad that you didn't show up, but just, like, let me know when you get this. Please answer your calls or your text. Thanks. Bye. Hey, Jane, it's Natalie. Um, I haven't seen you at school in a while. Hi, Jane. Yeah, I'm fine. I was actually, I was just wondering if you wanted to hang. Oh, okay. I'll be there in 10. Bye. Uh, hi, I'm Hagai, um, and uh, yeah. I'm Agnes. And uh, our other partner on this project uh, wasn't able to be here today, and that was Jace Giuliano. Um, but uh, we, for our Story of Now videos, which the Story of Now videos were kind of a very open and flexible project where we could take any issue or any um, problem that was kind of near and around us that we felt strongly about and uh, we're passionate about that was really current. It was something that was um, we were focused on in this moment, hence story of now. Um, we could just take that and tell a story about it. And uh, so for our project, we chose to do a story on access to housing um, for queer and trans individuals and people of the LGBTQ plus community. 
um, we were lucky enough to get to interview um, Terrence Robertson Bayless, who um, was a trans man and a veteran who was running for the fourth ward of S the city council of St. Paul, and uh, as well as um, a policy researcher from the Movement Advancement Project named Logan Casey, who we had a great connection to, luckily, because he happened to be also the partner of our wonderful teacher, Rachel. Um, so Rachel, Ange Rachel Angeli over there. Um, shout out, we get shout outs too. Um, so <laughs> we were able to do some um, really, really in-depth interviews. I wish we could have included more of those interviews, but tried to ke keep it to not 20 minutes long. Um, but yeah, they were really in depth. We got to really um, get to know these interviewers and get some of their, they had personal experience with the subject matter of homelessness and housing and um, being queer individuals. And they had um, just expert knowledge from their own career paths and uh, were able to share a lot of that with us. And also it was awesome that we got to like get to know each other as team members too and, and do shoots on location that we planned ourselves and set up these interviews ourselves and deal with a lot of that kind of like, kind of learn to roll with that and it was awesome. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. And so we'll just let you watch. Thank you. One of the more common narratives, uh, at least outside of the LGBTQ community, is that after marriage was legalized in 2015, that the LGBTQ community is at a, a pretty good place now, right? Uh, that we've come a long way, there's been a lot of progress made, things are generally okay for the queer community, broadly speaking. When in reality, it's the case that LGBTQ people across the country, uh, including in more liberal places like on the coast and in big cities, continue to experience routine discrimination and harassment and there are a number of areas of law including for youth and including in housing where lgbtq people are not protected at all and even in the face of that routine discrimination yeah i grew up in the higher range in minnesota and then right out of high school moved to st cloud state i started using drugs and alcohol to cope i dropped out of college and was really struggling, got to the point where I was no longer paying my rent because I was having issues holding a steady job and then wound up getting evicted from my apartment. I was living out of my car for a period of time and, and bouncing around on people's couches and then my car was repossessed. <laughs> uh, and so it was, it was going through this whole period of getting depressed, um, having suicidal ideations, and then finding myself, you know, without without stable housing. So there are no, uh, there's no single determining factor that leads to a person experiencing homelessness in general. And the same is true for LGBTQ people and for LGBTQ youth. There are many, many factors that could lead to someone experiencing homelessness. We need to look at other factors that people are facing. You know, whether it's food instability, lack of access to opportunity, or lack of uh, access to, to training and workforce development solutions. People are rent burdened because they have childcare costs. I mean, there are so many things that play into that, that we need to treat the other symptoms in, that, that are happening and not just focus solely on building more housing. We need to have a much more diverse and inclusive approach to helping people be able to afford and get access to housing. Family rejection is definitely one of the contributing factors to many LGBTQ youth experiencing homelessness. Um, we know that that's true both because of the personal stories and, and narratives that we've seen from folks who have had that experience, but also from broader statistics that show us that LGBTQ youth are more than twice as likely as non-LGBTQ youth to experience homelessness in their lifetime. And so we know that uh, family rejection is part of that, or their being LGBTQ at least contributes in some way to their likelihood of experiencing homelessness. And for black LGBTQ youth, they are four times as likely uh, as white non-LGBTQ youth to experience homelessness. So this is definitely, uh, family rejection is definitely a part of it, but again, it's not the only factor that leads to experiences of homelessness. Well, I, I wasn't aware of any other additional support services or community programs that were available for LGBTQ people and or people experiencing even substance abuse and or mental health issues or housing instability. So I had no idea where to turn for support. Other than the people that I had in my life, I really didn't know. And so in the example of housing in particular, uh, 
Recent surveys, national representative surveys, show that about one in four LGBTQ people have experienced discrimination in housing. And if you look just at transgender people, that number is pretty much the same. About one in four transgender people in the last year alone have experienced discrimination in housing because of their transgender identity. And so despite this broader narrative that things are much better than they used to be, or at least that things are pretty much fine now after marriage, this is still a routine experience for many people in the LGBTQ community. Yeah, we have to, to ensure that we're inclusive for queer and trans individuals. You have, we have to look at the policies themselves. And the first thing, the easiest thing to do is look at language. Frankly, are we using inclusive language in our policies? Are we putting an equity lens to our policies? The best way to do it is to get the people that are affected to the table. We have to have those voices be a part of the conversation in shaping policy development and then seeking authentic community engagement throughout the process so that when we come through on the other end of it, we can ensure that we are actually meeting the needs of the communities that are directly affected by programming and by policies all along the way. I was very fortunate to have some people that no matter, no matter how bad I screwed up, they didn't give up on me. It's more about a broader fraying of relationships over time within that family that increases the likelihood that the child will experience homelessness after coming out. Uh, and so that fraying of relationships can be due to a number of different factors, including the family's struggle to accept their child, but also due to other, or influenced by other contributing factors that are, have nothing to do with the kid being LGBTQ. It could be anything from economic insecurity, or job loss, or some kind of experience of trauma, or uh, st struggling with addiction or recovery. There could be any number of things that are creating this broader family instability that lead to their potentially experiencing homelessness. You have to surround yourself with support systems, and that's going to look different for everybody. And I would just say that you're normal and you're beautiful, you know, and finding people that will affirm your identities and that will uplift you and be there for you no matter what, those are the types of people and the relationships that you have to have in your life. Okay, hello, my name is Hannah. I'm Caroline. I'm Terrell. And this is, or we will be showing our story of us. Um, the story of us is the third video we made in the series. Um, and for this video, we partnered with a community organization. Um, us personally partnered with The Alley. Shout out to Susan. <laughs> Who's in the back. <laughs> Um, so for the story of us, you, like I said, partner with a community organization and work with them to figure out what kind of video they want to help promote their organization and um, something that fits with our mission and with HECUA for the program. Um, so The Alley is a community newspaper located in the neighborhood of Phillips and they are really focused on making um, news content that is by the community for the community. Um, and so we wanted to highlight that in our video. Um, we did a lot of interviews, we attended an event, um, we spent some quality time in the neighborhood of Phillips and did some research on the archived versions of the newspaper and pulled that all together in like two weeks of editing and here we are. It is the community, it's community governed media and people that have an issue that they want to write about, we'll work with them on it. As long as it's not personal and you know attacking other people and being used in a bad way, but as long as you want to organize um, and if you have an issue, you, you can have space in the alley. Newspapers like the, the uh, alley, they, 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 they're zero in on, on people's day-to-day -day lives. 
just ordinary people. people who live in that community or who have lived in that community. And that is something that, uh, that the uh, newspaper does very, very well. Phillips community is so big, 22,000 people, give or take a thousand here or there because the, it's hard to take a census, as we've learned. Um, so that's a third, Phillips is a bit bigger than a third of the counties in the state of Minnesota. 57 counties and it's bigger than one third of them. So we all have our own government, those counties. We should have our own because we're that big. We have everything here. We have retail, we have business, we have international corporations, we have mom and pa stores, you know, all of that. So it's very complicated. One of the things that's happened over the years, and it had something to do with the founding of the alley, is that the media that we depend on isn't reflecting accurately what does go on in that, that uh, 1.5 uh, square mile or whatever it is. So, because we, we discovered that where Phillips is, is misrepresented, uh, where a stigma is put on the community. So uh, early on, we thought, we're going to reverse that stigma. How do, how do we change that? We can't, we can't burn what's written, even though there's, there's things been written about the community in papers or journals or magazines that are now in the archives at the U and different places, I know on the internet, that people, when doing research, go and look at that. Actually, a couple of years ago, Harvey, our family, really wanted him to stop being the interim editor. And we were starting to come to that understanding that it's wrong for one person to be the editor. To do that, we started on the course of what was called a transition process. I was facilitating this discussion about if we're going to transition the alley, we also have to first know what it is. What role does the alley play? And then you saw the picket signs from our event our 45th celebration event, those picket signs were the capture of the essences of the eight things that got lifted up in that first conversation during the transition process. It was something like the alley is about the liberation. And I had never thought about that before. And deliberation, like, what does that mean? It's when you're actually wrestling with an issue and within a community that there is different Decide the sides of it. The real gold is in the deliberative process. P people who read and who are interested in finding out about the Phillips in the Seward neighborhood, uh, they need to pick up the uh, alley. One of the things I like about the alley is our writers are volunteer. We encourage people, if you have something going on that you want people to know about, you write about it, we'll put it in. We might help you with some of the writing if you need some help with that. But if you don't, you just write it in your own words and we're going to print it. And this is our story from Phillips, which is another reason why having our paper archived at the, at the library is if people want to know more about Phillips, they will get some depth by looking at our community newspaper because this is coming from people in the community and it's their stories and their words about what, what their experience is in this community and you don't get that in the mainstream papers. <laughs> All right, so yeah, that was just kind of a sampling of the videos that we did this semester. Um, big thanks to SPNN where we had class and also interned. We spent a lot of time in this building and it's, it's been a lot of fun and definitely gonna miss all the people here. Um, thanks to all the staff, Amelia, Rachel, 
Bonnie. Shout out. Steve. <laughs> Steve, you're in the booth. Tang. 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 Shout out Metro Sound and Lighting. Um, <laughs> Martin. Uh, yeah, but Bianca. Michael. Yeah, we all, we all had a lot of fun. And what else? Thank you. Um, All right, thank you. Making media, making change. That was awesome. All right, so now we have our third and final class, which is the Environmental Sustainability Semester. Um, so you all can make your way up. And in the meantime, we have an announcement from Liza. And Miguel, too. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Liza gorman Bear. Um, I am the campus representative for the University of Minnesota for HECUA. I'm also a HECUA alum, Art for Social Change 2017. So it's a little bit weird and exciting to be back up on the stage. I feel like I want to do some karaoke or something for all of you. But I just want to give a really big shout out to the recruitment and student services team of HECUA. If you're on that team, please wave your hand in the air. Excellent. And I'm doing this not just because I'm a part of that team, but um, because I've seen firsthand the incredible work and effort that we put into to make sure every student has a really special experience and um, is able to uh, do the program of their dreams. Um, and if you are a current HECUA student, or I guess at this point a former HECUA student, and are looking for a way that you can do that, I know Audra highlighted the, um, the Alumni Ambassadors program earlier, but I have a really exciting announcement for U of M students and alumni who are doing HECU programs, that we are hiring three new student advisors for the University of Minnesota for the coming semester. Applause, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so if you are an alum of environmental sustainability, making media, making change, or Art for Social Change, who I don't get a wink for, um, we are hiring new student advisors for those programs. Um, and the requirements are that you are a HECU alum and a current or former student of the University of Minnesota, and ideally an alum of the program you would like to represent, but um, since all HECU programs have some similar values and everything, we can um, have alum from any domestic program. These are part-time positions, 20 hours a week, um, and speaking as someone who was a student advisor for the past roughly two years, it's a really engaging, fun position. There's a lot of creativity, super, super flexible, so you can fit it along with your classes or whatever else you may be doing. Um, and it's a really great way to give back and stay connected with the HECUA community, with your school, with community partners. It's just a really awesome opportunity. So if you are interested in becoming the next HECUA student advisor for your program, um, awesome. You can come talk to me. I feel like I'm pretty hard to miss. I'll be sitting in the back there hanging out afterwards. Or else, um, I want to make sure I got the URL right, you can go to hecua.org slash about slash get dash involved, which is... <laughs> which is where we post um, open job positions like this one, also volunteer opportunities if that's more your jam. Um, and ideally we would love to have an application um, by two weeks time, however that is the day after Christmas and our office will be closed, so I'm not going to judge if you need to get in a few days late early. <laughs> But yeah, if you're interested, talk to me, um, go to the website and check out the application. It's a great time. I would love to. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Miguel. Um, shout out to Michael. Shout out to Audra. Shout out to Matt. <laughs> um, yeah, and I use he and his gender pronouns. Uh, I'm a senior at the University of Minnesota, and I'm a current um, HECU senior advisor for inequality in America. So shout out to Lisa. Um, so if you want to like learn more about him, uh, the position, you can like talk to me. Um, 
I wanted to tell you about an event um, that I'm trying to organize um, in January. Uh, it's kind of like a back to school event for HECUA students. Uh, speaking as a HECUA alum, uh, I never had one of those, and so it was really hard to like keep up with my current HECUA students or, or my former HECUA peers. Uh, so I'm trying to organize like a back to school event at the U of M uh, to kind of you know like get together, uh, talk about our breaks, talk about what we're excited for next semester, what we're scared for, uh, get free food. Um, and so um, I wanted to give you like a save the day thing. Uh, it's not set in stone, but I'm looking at uh, January 29th. It's a Wednesday. So put it on your uh, Google calendars. Um, if you're filled, your actually physical calendar, but <laughs> just kidding. I'm sorry. I'm s that was, I'm, s <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah. Yeah. No, um, your typewriter. Um, so yeah, uh, it's a it's gonna be a cool way. Free food. It's like five to seven, and um, you've probably received an email from me before, but um, you'll hear from me like first week of Jan first week of the semester. Um, yeah, I think that's all I got. Thank you. And now environmental sustainability. Okay, hi everybody. Um, we're the environmental sustainability uh, class. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna introduce ourselves first and then we have a PowerPoint for you. Um, and then we're gonna do a sh brief closing after that PowerPoint presentation. Um, okay, so I am from St. Paul, the Macroveland neighborhood. My ancestors on one side were um, Swedish immigrants and carpenters, and on the other side, they were homesteaders. So my work is healing that legacy. Um, now I go to St. Catherine University. I'm a senior. Um, and last semester, I was in New Zealand with Hecua. Um, so part of me is from there as well now. Um, and what else? Oh, I interned at Lily Springs Farm with Drew. Um, and my name is Emma, and my pronouns are she, her. OK, anyways. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Amara. I use they, them pronouns. I go to the University of Minnesota. Um, I'm a junior, and I grew up in St. Paul. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Mynia. She's my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> There's my boyfriend. <laughs> I'm a third year at St. Catharines University studying public health with a concentration in public policy. Hello, my name is Matt. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a third year studying environmental science and Chinese at the U. And this semester, I interned at Frogtown Farm, which is an urban farm in Frogtown, Minnesota. Hi, I'm Kelly. Um, I also go to the U. I have an individualized major in three concentrations, um, sociology, public health, and sustainability. And my parents immigrated from Laos. Hi, I'm Jocelyn. I'm a junior at the U. I also have an individualized study of sustainability, environmental science, and Spanish. And this semester, I interned at Pillsbury United Communities. Hi, I'm Christine. Um, I am a senior at the University of Minnesota studying food systems. And I also interned at uh, Pillsbury United Communities. Hi, everyone. My name is Aaliyah Julian Rubio. I am a senior at the College of St. Scholastica. Yep, all right, yeah, I was waiting for that shout out. Um, but uh, I'm double majoring in Global Cultural Studies in Spanish, and during this past uh, semester, I interned at Environmental Initiative, and shout out to my supervisor, who said he was gonna be here, but it's not here, but still shout out to him, Bill. Bill? Oh my gosh! 
gosh, hi, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I was sad, but thank you. Shout out to Bill. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Miranda. I'm at the University of Minnesota studying sociology, sustainability, and soil science. Um, and I was also at Lily Springs for my internship. So yeah, shout out to Drew. <laughs> and we're missing a couple classmates, so shout out to them too. I think Ingrid and Dustin. Environmental Initiative and Sierra Club. Okay, <laughs> so I want to start by um, inviting you guys to consider where in the world are we? Um, I this was inspired. This was inspired um, for me by actually going on Google Earth and. Um, flying from New Zealand to Minnesota and just watching the whole globe like spin by. Um, so I put this up here to remind us that this is where we're all from, the earth. And um, so I want to invite you all to think about where you are from, where you grew up, where your people are from, whether or not you've been there. Um, and I want you to breathe into all of those places and bring them with you um, as we continue. Um, so zooming in a little bit more, this is Turtle Island, also known as North America. Um, the name Turtle Island comes from a creation story where Sky Woman falls to Earth and there's only water. And all of the animals take turns trying to dive down to retrieve soil from the bottom of the water. And eventually they succeed and Turtle offers their back for the land to be created on, for, to hold the soil. Um, so I didn't really realize, I could not ever really see how North America was shaped like a turtle until I finally Google image searched. So I want to let you guys know, like the, the top, the white part up there is the head and then the feet Alaska's one of the feet. Down here, Florida's one of the feet. And it's like a snapping turtle, so Mexico is like the tail. Um, I, I hope you can see it, because I, I thought it was really cool. Um, so now zoom in a little bit more. Um, this is where we are, closer, closer and closer to where we are. Uh, Minnesota Makoche means um, the land where the sky is reflected in the water, or land of cloudy water. Um, and I wanted to offer you this image of the Mississippi watershed to give you a different way of looking at land and borders because the outline of our state is just something drawn on a map. Um, so this is a Missi Mississippi watershed um, and a, a really interesting piece of wisdom that we learned this semester from Lindsay Raybon was that we really should be organizing by watersheds, not counties um, or cities because water is life. <laughs> so next slide has, that's a visual if you're kind of, it's hard to tell where, what we're looking at because um, we're not used to it. Um, and so then next slide, I want to tell a story that I learned this summer that I didn't really retain from my grade school education um, of the US Dakota War of 1862. Um, and I'm going to try to keep it short because I could go on for a while. But the so when as the westward expansion was happening and Minnesota was trying to become a state, um, there were a series of treaties signed um, throughout a few years, and you can see dates on there, um, but I can't remember them, so I'm just going <laughs> to tell you the story um, in a vague, you know vague time timeline. Um, so eventually, um, the there were two treaties signed with the Dakota people, and they were just sort of divided into like the upper and lower, um, referred to as the upper and lower Sioux. And 
those when those treaties were signed, um, they were there were two and they were signed in the same year, 1851 it looks like. And they were it, within the treaties, the Dakota peoples were given reservations to live on, and that's what you can see right here in red. Um, that's on the north and, and south banks of the Minnesota River. But they retain their rights to travel outside of their treaties for food and hunting and, and continuing to live. They were just only settling um, in those areas. And when those treaties were signed, they were also told they were signing a third copy of each treaty, and they were actually signing traders' papers, which were written by the fur traders and allowed the payments, which were going to be paid to the Dakota people from the US government for their land, to be taken directly by the fur traders to whom Dakota people were in debt in a system that was already placing them in debt unfairly. So eventually, once these reservations were in place, there was a lot of corruption in the Indian Affairs offices, and the people were not getting their payments, which were um, both money and food and supplies, so the conditions were very poor. Um, the Lower Sioux Agency, um, like Indian agent, I believe, and I don't remember his name, but who cares about his name, um, is famously said, if they're hungry, let them eat grass. And that was part of starting the US-Dakota War of 1862, which also was happening during the um, Civil War. So this is a, like, it's, a, it's something that gets buried under the Civil War history. Um, so then, after the war, the Dakota lost, and there were th around 200 to 300 warriors sentenced to death in unfair trials. Um, and then event Abraham Lincoln actually looked over all of the trials and pardoned all except for 38. Um, and then the rest of the people, um, women and children and people who were not convicted of war crimes were rounded up and taken on a death march up to um, Fort Snelling, which is actually Bedote, which means like place of convergence, um, where, where the two rivers come together. And that location is actually um, a sacred place for the Dakota people, similar to like the Garden of Eden. It's like they're the, the center of their world. So they were placed in a concentration camp there um, where many people died and sickness was rampant. Um, and the meanwhile, the 38 men were executed in the largest mass hanging in this country's history. And Governor Ramsey, who was the first governor of the state at the time, is quoted with saying something along the lines of that all Dakota people must be driven from this state um, it, and like in order for us to become a state. So that coincides um, with not only the people being completely kicked out of their homeland, but also the Buffalo, Tatanka, completely killed off and removed from this state and driven west. Um, over the summer, I, I took a course on, on this history and we traveled to um, some various cities in the south of Minnesota and we saw um, the taxidermied head of the last Tatanka killed in the state of Minnesota. And I didn't even, as, as a child and growing up, this is something I didn't even know um, that there were, that, that bison lived here. I thought they were all sort of Western Plains animals because they're, they're not here. Um, so, yeah, that's what I wanted to give you guys as sort of an opening to think about this is where we are, um, and this state is founded on um, ethnic cleansing, racial cleansing, and, and um, genocide. And also, 
it's super beautiful and there's 10,000 lakes um, and land is, I think, one of the most, or if not the most important thing in our human life. So uh, yeah, welcome to, <laughs> welcome to environmental sustainability. Um, and now, <laughs> Um, and now my uh, um, classmate, Amara, is going to tell you about mushrooms. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to talk um, a little bit about what I did my final presentation project on, which is mushrooms and mycelium. And I think it's just a really... I don't know, important topic to talk about just because a lot about what our class is about is about relationship. And I think um, mushrooms and mycelium really embody that um, kind of sense of relationship and sense with everything that um, is a living being on this planet. And so I just wanted to, um, as you see this picture right here, there's a little sapling supported by all these different little threads of mycelium. And so um, if we just think about the land we're standing on right now, um, deep under our feet lies a whole web of a hidden world of mycelium. Um, and like I said before, mycelium are underground fun fungal networks um, that connect the roots of plants. And um, they operate with the greater ecosystem in mind um, constantly engaging in mutually beneficial relationship with everything on Earth. Um, and mu I guess to talk about mushrooms, too, to define that, mushrooms are, while mycelium are the root network, um, mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of mycelium. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and so kind of like how I said before, I really feel um, mushroom and mycelium embody um, uh, earth care, people care, and future care, which are principles of permaculture, um, a concept, I guess, kind of system that we've been studying a lot this semester. And, um, and so, I guess, talking about the mushroom uh, uh, influence of this, uh, they use their networking and decomposing abilities to share nutrients with plants and break down toxic chemicals to keep the land and other beings healthy. And so they have um, they're really amazing in this way. They extract and store toxins in their little fruiting bodies, uh, and they, uh, I mean, they can extract toxins from the land, such as metals, plastics, pesticides, dyes, etc. Um, and the, I, um, they also have a really wonderful effect on our bodies too when taking them medicinally. Um, they've been used throughout the history of mankind to treat a ton of diseases like cancer and, and others, um, and. Mushrooms are just really prime examples of coexisting with nature in harmony um, rather than competing. And they are, in this way, indigenous at the core. Um, and you know, the mycelium root system, as I've said before, uh, really supports this ability to coexist in this way. And so I think there's a lot to, at least for me and I think all of us, to f reflect on the ways um, our relationships with the land and our relationships with each other and um, how we can carry these lessons from mushrooms and mycelium and how uh, we can enact them in our own lives. And, and also um, in terms of toxins, how we can each of us just reflect on our role in our mycelial network and in, um, to work towards you know, decomposing these systems of oppression and just, yeah, really reflect on how we can work in relationship with each other to move towards liberation. And so the next slide, we have some discussion questions for you all. And so if everyone wants to like group up in small groups of, I don't know, whatever feels like the right size, um, uh, kind of, as I just said, just a couple questions here, um, just what we can just, you know, be in conversation about what do you think your role is in your mycelial network and what does your network look like? And um, how do you see yourself utilizing your personal capacities um, as a part of a larger movement towards liberation? And yeah, that's a lot to, to
to talk about and reflect on. Sorry. Um, but if we <laughs> can just, you know, just at least start those conversations here and, you know, can carry them forward from this room also. Hello again, friends. As, as you uh, complete your conversations, I think to, to take a cue from our ES students that these are conversations we hope you take with, with you on your, way, uh, on your way out today and as, as you continue to ponder these big, big questions uh, in your life and in your work. I want to, you know, in the, in the spirit of making this has become a, maybe a new heck of a tradition of, of utilizing the time to make some really critical announcements as we go, but I think as critical as the earlier announcements have been, um, I think this is a, an equally, um, arguably in some ways, much more significant announcement um, as, uh, as we move forward. As I've laid out this very ominous tone, um, <laughs> I'm going to continue. Um, I, wanna, I wanna take this, uh, this moment to offer gratitude um, and thanks, you know, one of the, the, the greatest opportunities we have when we gather at this point in a semester is it's a celebration of a culmination of a journey. Um, it's a journey for each learning community that, that we've, uh, we've kind of curated. Um, and it's, a, it's an opportunity to sort of celebrate, but a little bit, you know, it's a little sad for your cohort to, to kind of disassemble in a way at the end of a semester. And hopefully um, you take a cue from Miguel that there's an opportunity for you to stay together. Um, as, as your journey kind of takes a new shape and form. Um, but we also have other transitions um, at the end of journeys that we, we ought to kind of keep in mind and, and celebrate and offer gratitude for. And so as much as this makes me sad to say, um, it is also an opportunity for us to offer gratitude and thanks to the leader, the program director of the ES program, Sam Grant, who for the last five years has uh, led and, and taught and facilitated and cared for a learning community um, in the ES program expertly and carefully uh, and with great love. And so um, begrudgingly and sadly uh, announcing Sam sort of moving on from HECUA at the end of the semester. Um, but as Sam often says, and I can, I can paraphrase with, with citation, um, that when you're a part of the, once you're a part of the learning circle, you're always a part of the learning circle. And so I, I want to offer that gratitude on behalf of HECUA and on behalf of all of us here today. So thank you, Sam. and much less ominously than I did, your students are going to offer their, their words and, and, and comments. Thank you. Um, I just want to say a big thanks to Sam. Um, you have been such an amazing professor or facilitator, um, <laughs> teacher. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping me in my internship experience. Um, I know that it was a little bit wobbly, but you helped me. Um, take charge of my own learning experience, and I'm forever grateful for that. So thank you. Um, um, <laughs> I just want, I want to thank Sam, but also um, all the staff and people who have come in to participate in our classes. Um, it really made it feel like a family and a community. Um, and also, Sam again, for, I feel like he's given us this an energy of like just being really relaxed and not like so stressed about having to follow a time schedule. Um, it's just, it's really refreshing. So I wanna thank Sam for that. Yeah, just so I, there's a lot I could say, um, all of us could say about Sam. <laughs> Limit it to one sentence. Um, but yeah, I think from you know me and all of us can say that you really I don't know created a space where dreams are alive and you're able to breathe into them, and I think that it's really invaluable. So just thank you very much for that. Yeah, I've never had an instructor or met really anyone else like Sam before. Um, <laughs> one time I was talking about how I felt lost and how I feel lost, and Sam was like. No, like change your mindset, you feel open instead. And so that'll stick with me forever. Yeah, um, Sam, I wanna thank you. I feel like in this past semester, I've 
had a lot of different experiences for myself and just like an education that I have during my entire experience as an undergraduate student, which something Hecuo gave me, but also you gave me as well. Um, I also don't think I've had a professor swear as much in a class. <laughs> um, so just kidding, but not actually. And it's you're done now, so I can say that. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Um, Sam, I want to thank you for your spirit and for your um, for your love and um, for treating us as your family. A big focus of this class um, was dreaming into creating a better future and that was really refreshing. Um, yeah, so thanks for encouraging us to dream and connecting us with so many awesome EJ activists. Um, I was recently just talking with some other students in the other program and I was telling them that um, I initially wasn't going to do this environmental sustainability program. Um, I was going to do the one in Ecuador, but sadly that one got canceled. But it was honestly one of like the greatest blessings um, in my life because, oh my gosh, I'm like going to start crying. <laughs> okay. But um, it was honestly one of the greatest. It is. Okay. Blessings um, in my life. Um, especially um, getting to know Sam as and all the other community um, faculty that I got to meet throughout this journey, um, really reconnecting um, with the land and just like my internship and like meeting these people in my class and really like truly learning to like love myself and knowing that one day in this world I can make a difference. So thank you so much, Sam. Sam, it's been an honor. Um, I'm grateful to have been your last cohort. Um, and on the first day of class, you told us you loved us all. So thank you for that. And, you know, while the students have given me love and praise, part of Hecua's journey for the last five years has been in deep, loving partnership with my soul sister here. And what she's given to these students is beyond words in the depth of its love, the depth of its capacity, the depth of its gift. Drew, get, come on up here, man. I was, gonna, I was almost going to swear, but I held off. I did a good job. <laughs> You're welcome, Mom. <laughs> Um, and this is Drew, who is the uh, amazing permaculture farmer at Lily Springs Farm. If you ever walk on a landscape and you hear the landscape speak to you when you arrive, you know that that landscape is actively loved. So these two have embodied the practice of loving a landscape, and they've taken that practice of loving a landscape and brought it into loving uh, educational journey of liberation with our students here. And so as part of our work, we are giving permaculture design certifications to our students. And so I'm just gonna sort of pass them to Drew. Drew will call off the names and then people can shake me and Lindsay's hands as they walk by this way. <laughs> Ooh, my Nia. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Congrats. Thank you. Nice little pick. Dustin. Yeah, See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Emma. That's my intern. Thank you. Ingrid. By mail. Christine. Matt. Good 
This is Jocelyn. On to Kelly. You're welcome. Great work. Aaliyah. <laughs> and Amara. I didn't have to look on that. <laughs> Just a couple words, a uh, little unprepared, but um, one of the things that Sam brings, uh, the energy and uh, one of the students mentioned spirit to this, um, and in the last few years, working together with him is the amazing network um, that he brings together. And so one, for example, is having an elder in the classroom is, is really a game changer. Um, so having, Lewis in our class has been just incredible um, for for all of us. Um, so just so not just you know who you see right now, but there's so many threads to who Sam weaves into um, the program, and that's really the depth that you get, the depth and diversity that I don't see in other educational programming. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. I guess is this really diverse weaving that Sam does. Um, in his work that makes it so spirit um, filled. And the other thing is that that I, I was talking with another colleague this morning about Sam is that uh, he's a bit irreplaceable, sorry, Hecua, um, <laughs> because his what he gives to his students is um, you know personal access, uh, which is very unusual in the educational world um, as well. and Obviously, you can't be a good student if you are struggling with housing issues or um, uh, being a single mom and having a hard time paying a bill or being really stressed about where you might be living or a domestic issue that you might be involved in. And so that's real. Um, so to also go to school and then um, have that, to have a person that you could share personal with um, in order so you can succeed academically um, is something that Sam brings to the program that I've just, it's really uncomparable. Um, so thank you so much for everything that you've given to students over the years. Yeah, I'm super, super, I'm Drew from Lily Springs Farm. I'm super, super proud to be affiliated with HECUA and so grateful for these students and the effort that they put in this semester. And uh, every semester working with Sam and Lindsay has been totally mind-blowing and amazing and uh, and this was no different on that journey but I, I'm really I hammered all semester like uh, sometimes it doesn't feel like everything that you pick up in college is going to be applicable when you take it into the real world and have to go change everything like you got to change everything you got to fix everything you got to change everything you got to fix it fix it you got to change everything and and like that's that's a lot of pressure and and so the way the way that Sam brings these lessons to all of us in a way that we can kind of, okay, like accept the circumstances in as much as like, now we have to orient around a solution. Like, not, not like accept it like it's gonna be here forever and it's okay, but like accept that it is what it is so that we can talk honestly and be real with each other. It's just, it's such a healthy way to exchange and, and uh, be in discourse with each other. And very, very grateful and it's gonna stick with me forever. We're not done yet, Sam. We're not done yet. Um, you know, there, there's been a lot of change uh, kind of on the HECUA administrative side of things for the last year or so. And so um, as we looked around the landscape and started thinking about it, I've had the great fortune of over the last year and a half that I've been with HECUA to, to stay connected and to work closely with Sam. Um, but that, that, like, I'm a veteran in that. Um, and so as, as we look around and as we think about the, our colleagues who've, who've worked very closely with Sam over his five years, Phil Sandro has had the kind of the closest working relationship with Sam in that they share an office. 
office, um, but they uh, certainly those five years together. So I'd like to ask Phil to come and share a little bit about um, his work with you and, and kind of on the HECUA side, um, the kind of word of, of gratitude and thanks. Hi, I'm Phil, he and his pronouns. Um, oh man, Sam. <laughs> um, my heart is pounding right now uh, for a lot of reasons um, because I'm feel, feeling a lot of emotions um, and among a few um, are sad. I don't know if I'm more ominously ominous than you, you have, Mohammed. <laughs> um, but the other is, is grateful, really grateful, and also really glad. Okay. Sad you're leaving because so much leaves with you. Um, grateful, I've learned so much from you. You know, we do submarine duty together in the same office, you know, <laughs> and we have the most far-ranging talks. We share things personally. We take each other in each other's trust, and you've been one of the most stimulating colleagues I think I've ever had, actually. Um, you're a dreamer, okay, and one who imagines, and that's a gift, because I don't think we, we can change the world, but if we don't know where, what we want to change, um, we can reproduce things that can be pretty awful. And what Sam does is he imagines a different world. Okay, that's, that's, that's core, I think, to your life. He's gotten me to do that more, and more importantly, I think he does that for his students. Okay? That is so important as a, as a teacher. Um, you're brilliant, you're scary smart. <laughs> uh, you're a thought leader. We've really, really benefited from that. But you're not just up here. You know, as your students have said better than I can say, you come from a place of love, okay? You connect here and here. You lead with here and your spirit, okay? And that guides, that's in, you know, absolutely connected to the work you do in the world. Um, and your students are lucky for that. Um, it makes them feel seen, heard, safe. Not safe to be challenged, but, but safe to be challenged. Um, that's a gift, it's a teaching gift. Um, you know your students. You know, I, you, sometimes you have one-to-ones with all your students before the program even starts. Okay? You know who they are, their interests, and you carefully craft a program around that and continue to develop their interests. I've seen you do it. I've seen you struggle um, to do that, to think that through as we talk in our office. Um, the, the, one more thing is, your relationships with the community, as the Lily Spring Farms folks just said, is not transactional, okay? It's transformative. You have made community connections because you worked, put in blood, sweat, and tears with a lot of these organizations, you know? And one of the best practices in experiential ed is reciprocity, okay? I've never seen anyone do it as well as you do it, okay? So, <laughs> um, I'm glad, okay, because you've made a strong decision to move on in your life, okay? We've loved having you here. We've grown because of you, but I've, I know you have dreams. <laughs> We've talked about some of the options. It's a strong and hard decision because I know you're still ferreting that out. So I'm glad for you uh, that you're taking the bold step to, to move on, okay? So thank you so much I'm, on behalf of all of us. I think your students said it all in a much more eloquent way than I could, so thank you. I can't really follow that. I don't have much else to, to say that, that is as powerful as, as what the students have shared and, and as what Phil has shared. I think, um, you know, what you've experienced today is an illustration of the, of the web that we must weave. That's not a, do you weave a web? Um, of, of all the work that's required to bring together these experiences to support the various learning communities in our programs. Um, we have high expectations for ourselves. We have high expectations for our students. Um, I, I think to take to take a kind of a, a, a nugget of, of wisdom from Sam is that you know we expect our students uh, to take responsibility for their learning, but in order for us to be able to do that, we have to set some conditions in our classrooms and in our learning communities that can support that, um, that can support that work. And so what you've seen today um, is just a sliver of that illustrated um, in the experiences of our students. Um, the, the, all of all of you in this room, all of the wonderful people who support the work that HACUA does. Uh, more broadly in our communities are all of the people that are, they're all of our teachers. They're all
your, all of your teachers. They're, they're the members of our community that come together to support your individual learning, that respond, respond to your individual needs as a student and as a person. Um, and, and that gives me great uh, joy in that we've been able to create a, a community of, of teaching and learning that can support that work um, in a very boring technical way. Each of you arrive with a toolbox to make change in your communities and in your context. And what we hope is that we've met our own promise of filling that toolbox with some options, some possible solutions, at least some additional questions that you can take on in your own journey and address them to your own to, to the problems in your own communities and challenges that are faced by people and individuals across your communities. And, um, and I think that that's a promise that we hope we live up to. Um, and we, we look to you to help us reorient ourselves every time we make that promise uh, in order for us to be better equipped to deliver on that promise. So with that, um, I want to offer a special thanks to all of our community partners, all of our students, family and friends that came to support students. Uh, our hosts, uh, our host today, SPNN, uh, live streaming. We'll make sure to get the, the link to our colleagues. It's going to be recorded. So we'll give them a special round of applause to SPNN for hosting today. Thank you, Making Media students, for ha letting us uh, you know, hang out in your, in your living room um, this morning. Uh, special thanks to all of our members of our consortium, uh, uh, faculty members and, uh, at the various colleges and universities that support the work that we do, uh, and our students and, and colleagues. So big, big special thanks. I, you know, I want to um, kind of close with that and, and go and celebrate. Celebrate the day, celebrate the culmination of a, of a semester, and uh, looking forward to seeing you in the next iteration of this journey. So thank you again for coming up. Thank you. Oh. Who wants to take pictures? People want to take, let's document this a little bit, take some pictures. So, of us, of us, not just like, not just of ladders and, yes. So students and, and program faculty and staff and come on up and we'll make it quick as we close. Thank you, thank you.